pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And the reason we're here today is because that is the closest thing to each of our hearts. It's the most dear and precious thing to each of us that we can worship God, not just in our churches on Sunday, but with our lives every day. Bishop Boyer and all our faithful clergy for your courage to lead us in this call for freedom. We need leaders. Praised be to God that we have you. It is a privilege for me to stand here in God's presence to speak on religious freedom. I am proud to be a Catholic Christian American. What I ask of you what I ask of you is that you be proud to be Catholic or Baptist or Lutheran or Jewish or Muslim or whatever you are. Be proud of the religious beliefs that you hold dear and demand your religious freedom as an American. When I was first asked to speak today, quite frankly, I panicked. And then I prayed. I told my students about it and decided to follow their advice. For they repeated to me my very own words that I had said to them when this HHS mandate first became known. If Catholics don't speak up, who will speak up? Come on, Mrs. Thayer, you have to do this. My good husband told me that was the answer to my prayer. You should know that I consider myself mainly just a mom who loves my Lord and my religion and my country. I am not super highly educated, and I am not a political person. But I do know enough to know that this HHS mandate, which is forcing us to pay for contraception, sterilization, and abortion-inducing drugs, isn't only or even mainly about the Catholic Church. And it isn't about women's rights. It is about chipping away at our freedom if our government can succeed in mandating to the Catholic Church that which goes against our consciences, make no mistake, he can mandate anything to anybody. What kind of freedom exists for people of conscience if we cannot, by law, exercise that conscience? These rights I have, that you have, should be protected by our government, not taken away by our government. By the inherent dignity of our very nature, we have the right to live in the freedom of following our consciences, not so that we may do what we want, but so that we can do what we ought. I have a conscience, an inner sanctuary of faith and reason. Therefore, I can monitor myself in all matters moral, and I know how to monitor my own fertility. I do not need the government to do it or pay for me to do it. I can handle this on my own. because I was given the gift of intellect and free will and the ability to use both. And I was born with the gift of a built-in fertility system, which is not a disease, as some in this country have decided it is. Quite the opposite. Fertility is a sign of abundant health. Truly, I have no desire to force my religious beliefs on anyone. I would just like to exercise mine. And I object to being told by my government that they will decide for me what procedures I must pay for and what products I must buy for others. This is a direct infringement on my conscience and my freedom, and inasmuch as I am a religious person, on my religious freedom. 
Have we not learned anything from history about how hindering religious freedom leads quickly to religious persecution? I can speak personally about two cases of religious persecution regarding two of my own children. In one case, our young elementary daughter's teacher told all the students to bring in their favorite stories to share with the class. Our daughter was unable to share hers, however, because it contained the word Christmas. To another of our daughters, her experience happened in college. One of her professors took time in class one day to make fun of Christian homeschoolers, calling them overly religious social misfits. Our daughter spoke up and said, Excuse me, Professor so-and-so, I was homeschooled. Do you really consider me overly religious and a social misfit? The professor quickly recanted by saying, well, I guess there are a few exceptions. For you see, our daughter had already earned that professor's respect as a top student in the class. For our daughters who were trying to live their best moral life while exploring the world of academia, this felt like persecution. In other parts of the world, religious persecution either is or has been alive. We can all think of examples where this is true. China, Nazi Germany, early modern England, and parts of the Middle East and Africa, for example. Some countries have adopted a freedom to worship clause and call themselves countries with religious freedom. But this isn't freedom at all. What if we told people they could only eat at certain restaurants or sleep in certain places? we would certainly be said to be taking away their freedom. To tell people that they may practice their religion only in their places of worship is telling them they may not exercise their consciences outside of that place of worship. This has to be extremely wrong in a nation that was founded on religious freedom. And lest we forget, our forefathers left their homelands to come here for the promise of religious freedom. In doing a bit of research, I read a speech given by Dr. Brian J. Grimm. At the time of the speech in 2010, Dr. Grimm held the position of senior researcher for the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life, a nonpartisan research group based in Washington, D.C. Dr. Grimm said, and I quote, Overall, our study finds that more than 60 nations, nearly one-third of the countries in the world, have high or very high restrictions on religion. Some of these restrictions result from government actions, policies, and laws. Many of the restrictions measured throughout the world involve some degree of governmental force, coercion, harassment, or intimidation of religious groups." End quote. I pray that the United States of America never has its name put on that list. happening in this country feels like harassment, and women are being used as the battleground. This rhetoric about the church waging a war on women is nonsense. What is actually, what is actually happening is that this mandate categorizes all women as incapable of monitoring their own sexual behavior. Not only this, but women who object to this mandate are being forced to violate our consciences, fund the wrongs of others, treat unborn life as disposable, and dishonor the God-given gift of motherhood. There's a war on women, all right, but the church is not causing it. As a mother, my heart fears for all our children, but especially our own daughters and granddaughters. For this mandate does nothing to elevate women and everything to reduce women and subject them to further objectification. I pray that we all join together as Americans in this overwhelming and confusing issue. This fight is not going to be easy. However, on a positive end, I found a remarkable quote by Peter Kraft, professor of philosophy at Boston College. He says, and I quote, when we suffer, when we despair, when we cry in rage or helplessness, when we are bewildered, bedeviled, betrayed, besmirched, and besotted with the weight of the world, we need to listen to that echo for heaven. For saints, take their orders from the general, not the army. Thank you.
and may God the Father in heaven bless us all. We invite you to use your voices now. Let's be heard.